Greetings. Greetings from Phenomenology Read Aloud. And today we are here with a very, very important and very interesting topic, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. COPD is one of the most important topics in pulmonology. In real life scenario, the maximum patients of chronic respiratory disorders that you might see may be COPD. And with the increase in tobacco use and smoking, COPD is on the rise. It is one of the leading cause of mortality in the world. And here we are today to read aloud the COPD guidelines by the GOLD committee, which is the standard in COPD treatment. So let's get started. So this is what the goal guideline set is. It's an educational teaching set. It is available for easy download. You can go to the gold website and download this slide set for your later reference. I'm going to read it aloud for you so that it becomes easier for you to understand it and quickly revise it. Today we'll be discussing the first 30 slides. We'll come back with the part two for the next few. Let's get started. So first of all, talking about the etiology and pathology of COPD. Now COPD has one main thing, which is airflow limitation. And this airflow limitation exists with other pathologies, which are small airway disease, which are emphysematous changes in the lungs. So how does this airflow limitation start? So whenever the patient is exposed to some of the inhalational factors like smoking, indoor or outdoor pollution, occupational pollution, environmental tobacco smoke, and he or he has a predisposition for obstructive lung diseases genetically like uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, so host factors or an asthma which he had since childhood, the right complex of the host and the agent together lead to lung growth which is impaired number one number two an accelerated decline in lung growth and lung function injury to the lung and inflammation which is not restricted only to the lung but also systematically so it's very important now that copd is not a disease isolated to the lung there is a systemic inflammation involved so there is also extra pulmonary manifestations of COPD. So this leads to disorders in the small airway. It leads to emphysematous changes in the lungs and it leads to systemic effects like increase in risk of stroke, increased risk of cardiovascular morbidities. The airflow limitation that exists in COPD is a persistent airflow limitation as against to asthma where it is intermittent and seasonal and these together lead to clinical manifestations and symptoms so this is a very very important flow chart and it tells us how copd develops so if you see this slide it tells us that normally you know in every patient there is a decline in lung function which with age that is expected however whenever a patient has copd the decline is more so here they now talking about a person who's normal he will also have a gradual decline in lung function after the age of 40 but it would be up till the tune of 70 percent uh, of fev1 which is a normal healthy lung decline for a patient who would have small lungs but no copd this decline may be a bit more exaggerated but still he does not have a significant decline to cause it cause copd for patients with an initial normal lung function but they were smokers and had an accelerated decline in lung function copd may develop and their fev1 may fall to the tune of less than 60 percent when they touch the age of 60 to 70 and for patients who had abnormal lung growth initially and then formed copd this decline will be even more so how do we diagnose copd to diagnose copd symptoms host factors and spirometry so spirometry is very very important to diagnose copd according to the set definitions 
the symptom of COPD are just like asthma actually, but they are persistent. So here, breathlessness, cough production, sputum production. We classically divided COPD into two phenotypes, one who were chronic bronchitis and one who were emphysema. Lately, we have more phenotypes like asthma, COPD, asthma, COPD overlap and many others. So, there is a component where there may be more sputum or there is a component of COPD where there may be more breathlessness. This combined with the host factors with environmental tobacco smoke or exposure to pollution can result in COPD. To diagnose, you have to achieve a set defined value of FEV1 that classifies as COPD. What is this FEV1? It is the forced expiratory volume in the first second. So here we go. So whenever we diagnose COPD, what is important? Number one, symptoms. In symptoms, you have to have a dyspnea, which is gradually progressive, worsens with exercise and is persistent. It is not intermittent like asthma. Two, chronic cough, intermittent or unproductive or productive. It can be either. There may be or may not be a wheeze. And sputum production. Sputum production happens more in bronchitis variant as compared to emphysema. This patient may actually think of this sputum as a normal sputum production because of his smoking. But an increase in sputum production will warrant further investigation. If a patient who is a non-smoker COPD has a recurrent lower respiratory tract infections or childhood lung diseases and recurrent pneumonias or asthma, chances of COPD may be high. So this is also a good history. History of risk factors like smoking, active, passive, home cooking, chula smoke like in India or indoor air pollutants, occupational smoke, dust, vapors and fumes. This is important to elicit. Also, as I said, there may be a childhood history which may be important. So ask this history, the classical signs and symptoms and there we have a diagnosis. What are the differential diagnoses here? This slide by Gold talks about DDs or differential diagnosis. So I've already mentioned asthma so many times, but other differentials are those with other chronic lung diseases like cancer, TB, bronchiectasis, heart failure, ILDs, and other idiopathic causes. There are some extrathoracic causes of chronic cough, not the intralung ones, but the ones arising from upper airway, these may include gastroesophageal reflux disease, postnasal drip, chronic airway allergies, and medications. So whenever you have a patient complaining of chronic cough, ask about these two. So now coming back to COPD diagnosis, the main diagnostic modality available is spirometry. Spirometric diagnosis is very important to have a COPD diagnosis on your definition. So whenever a spirometry is performed, it is an operator driven test. Here the person has to exhale and we measure is forced expiratory volumes and forced vital capacity. So here they have given a few considerations for performing spirometry, how to prepare the patient, what is the post bronchodilator dosage of bronchodilator needed for testing and how it is done and what is the evaluation. We must know how it is performed, make sure that you know the various criteria and the main criteria of FEV1 upon FVC post bronchodilator. Something very important here is we're talking about a post bronchodilator FEV1 on FVC less than 70% will confirm the presence of airflow limitation so this we must know this is a normal spirometry it is a volume and time graph we also have other time graphs which are with the flow and which give a pattern like this and this one being the volume time curve here you have the volume in liters plotted with the seconds of expiration so whatever volume is expired in the first second is the FEV1 as in this case it is 4 liters the forced vital capacity the patient achieves 
is 5 liters and the ratio is more than 80% or 0.8. Whenever a patient has obstructive disease, you notice the FEV1 has gone down, the FVC has gone down, so the ratio is less than 70. This should be the post bronchodilator value to call it a obstructive airflow limitation or COPD. So, this is a very, very important table. This is the way it is divided. So, gold 1, gold 2, 3 and 4. All these patients should have a post-bronchodilator. Remember, it's post-bronchodilator for everyone. No confusions here. Less than 70%. Mild, moderate, severe and very severe. More than 80, 50 to 80, 30 to 50 and less than 30 gold one two three four the ratio is less than 70 percent and when you check the individual fev1 value 80 50 to 80 30 to 50 and less than 30. this is also a very very important component because nowadays we have a copd assessment test we also have a copd grading system where we need to see the functional breathlessness of the patient so modified mrc dyspnea scale has to be checked in each copd patient you must know these mrc grade 0 to 4 for examination purposes it is a very very important scale so as the score increases patient becomes increasingly breathless on day-to-day -day activity the way you can quickly remember is breathless only with exercise grade 0 grade 1 breathless on hurrying on level or walking uphill grade 2 walk slower than people of same age or stops for breath grade 3 stops for breath within 100 meters or few minutes on the level and grade 4 too breathless to leave the house too breathless in routine activities like dressing undressing this is the CAT assessment that I'm talking about. Again, a component of the recent change in goal guidelines. Very, very important from academics point of view. The CAT assessment is also a functional assessment of the severity of COPD. The score is divided and patient has to check between 0 to 5. 5 being worse and 0 being very mild symptoms. So, this test also will give us a composite score which will be further analyzed when we do the COPD ABCD assessment tool which is the next one. So this is the refined ABCD assessment tool. Very very important to know. There are apps. There is a gold guideline app available. These are available online or you can have this placed in your clinic. And you can always check the A, B, C, D grade of the COPD patient based on this. It's a very simple derivative. Here we're talking about exacerbation history. And here we're going to talk about the patient's FEV1 scores and CAT score. So divided into A, B, C and D. So more exacerbations would be grade D and C, less exacerbations A and B, more symptoms B and D, less symptoms A and C. Coming to spirometry again, basically it will play a very important role right at diagnosis, assessment of severity and follow up after a number of visits. So, this is a very, very important diagnostic test. Differentials of COPD we've already discussed. They lie the same as differentials of cough. Broadly, asthma is one strong differential. Other than that, cardiac failure or congestive heart failure and bronchiolitis. But anything causing chronic cough is a differential. This slide talks about smoking cessation. Smoking cessation is a very important part of COPD management. It should be covered in detail. When you're talking to your patient who is COPD, encourage him to quit. Remember the five A's, 
ask, advise, assess, assist and arrange. Vaccinations. Any patient with COPD must get at least two main vaccinations. One is the influenza vaccination each year and the two is PPSV23, 23 valent pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine or in patients above 65 years what is preferable is PCV13 conjugate pneumococcal vaccine which is once in a lifetime. The CDC has also included Tdap or pertussis vaccination for COPD patients who were not vaccinated in their adolescence to protect them from pertussis. These are the group of medicines that have been used in COPD. This is a good table but we do not for academic purpose need to remember the entire table. We will revisit this table when we talk about treatment for COPD. Also further the goal guidelines have given the treatment of COPD in terms of bronchodilators and anti-inflammatory therapy which we will be discussing in our next talk. So keep reading and we'll be back with the next part 2 gold guidelines using the gold guideline teaching set. Thank you and have a nice day.